it's box office top 10 time. Um, at number 22, The Blue Caftan. Which I really liked. Uh, we reviewed oh, I, this. Hang on, uh, I've skipped. Uh, to be honest, because my page is in the wrong order. So I've done a, I've done a Kermo. <laughs> okay, so you've done a me. Box office top 10. <laughs> at number 73, Harker. Which is a sort of very harrowing Tunisian <laughs> drama, which is inspired by, you know, a, a, a real story and real events. The film has real documentary grit to it. Very, very unflinching. And he kind of, you know, it goes on a, on an arc towards an inevitable tragedy. And it's, I thought it was, I think it was very good, but very, very edgy. Number 37, Pam Fear. Which is the Ukrainian drama, which we spoke about, I think, again, last week, which is a really, really interesting film, um, not just because of the circumstances under which it was made, but also because it tells this kind of, this story, which on the one hand has has a lot of grit to it, but also has a fairy tale element. We played a clip from the film last week, which was the, the three main characters walking through a wood. And they start making animal noises. And it is like suddenly we're in a Grimm's fairy tale in the middle of this kind of very realistic situation. I thought it was terrific. And again, you know, the soundtrack does so much to to make the film grip. Mm -hmm. uh, so now we finally get to The Blue Caftan, which is at number 22, <laughs> Callum in South London. <clears throat> I hope this doesn't read as a criticism because it is not intended that okay. way. But I wanted to Go point ahead. out something that struck me about Mark's review of Blue Caftan last week which is reflective of a lot of films and conversations more generally. In his review, Mark said that the main character was married to a woman, but that his looking longingly at other men and his relationships reveal that he is actually gay and that they are estranged to a degree because of this. I am paraphrasing slightly, says Callum. Now, I haven't seen the film, uh, and this may be stated explicitly uh, that he is gay but trapped in a marriage to a woman. But as a bisexual man, I feel I have to point out that this erases the not indistinct possibility that he too is bisexual. Too often, same-sex attraction, especially in men, is seen to take over someone's sexuality completely, meaning that they must be gay. And any opposite gender relationships are dalliances or past mistakes or marriages of convenience. Bisexuality is often forgotten. This is especially true of men. The overwhelming majority of bisexual representation on screen is of women, historically with a healthy dose of male gaze. And portrayals of bisexual men are often far from flattering. Hopefully this doesn't come across as a rebuke because you've both sensitively handled discussions of sexuality of gender and sexuality in the past, but instead as a gentle reminder to you and others that we do exist. Thank you both for your witterings, especially in the bonus takes and to the top-notch production team. Uh, Callum, needlessly praising our very fine production team, who seem to be getting as m as much praise as we do. But anyway, certainly in the certainly in the emails that get through to on air, yes. which tells you all you need to know. No, look, thanks for the email. Um, uh, what I would say is uh, the way in which the film presents this circumstance is. And I think you'd have to see the film to get this in terms of you know what's explicitly said and what is inexplicitly stated. Essentially, they have discussions about the fact that he has wrestled with his uh, sexuality throughout their marriage, and she knows, and she understands that that's the case, and um, she 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 still thinks she loves him, and still thinks, as she says, you know, I've never met a more honourable man. And he says to her, "I have tried, I have tried to suppress it, I have tried to overcome it." Now, that is not to say, I mean, you know, as we all know, sexuality is a spectrum, and all the rest of it. In terms of the approach of the film, the, if the film definitely presents somebody whose marriage marriage exists despite the fact that they don't appear to have a sexual um, uh, relationship that is untroubled by by he, he seems to be more attracted to men than he is to women. Um, and whether you call that gay or bisexual, you know, whatever it is, um, it, the film doesn't need to specify it. So, you know, apologies if I was simplifying for the purpose of... Having seen of the movie, is I, it I, possible I, that he's bisexual as opposed to gay? Of course yeah. it's possible. Okay. Of course mm -hmm. it is. Yes, I mean, absolutely. You know, they have they have physical relationships and... Uh, 
as you know, we are all polymorphously perverse and we are all on a spectrum of sexuality that is, in my opinion, fluid. Um, but, you know, so at no point in the movie do they actually define exactly what it is. And so, but I take your point entirely. But you should see the film because it's kind of interesting the way in which it discusses and visualizes that issue. And uh, number 10, we are actually now in the 10 is Return to Soul which I thought was really, really terrific. The most extraordinary thing about it is that Park Ji-min, who is the, plays the central character, who is uh, a, a, an adoptee who has grown up in France, who returns to Korea for the first time since she was adopted, is played by Park Ji-min, and she's not an actor. And she wasn't an actor before this. She's a visual artist. And she had some <laughs> biographical similarities, passing similarities with the character, but it's the first time she's ever acted. And it is an absolutely extraordinary performance. And it just goes to show we overlook casting so much. You know, we think that the, it, the genius of that film is that the director knew. David Cho knew that she was the person that he wanted okay. for the role, despite the fact that she had no acting experience, and she stepped up to the challenge and is brilliant. Uh, email from Do Won Shin. Dear BTS and Gangnam Style, I think I'll be Gangnam Style. I am a heritage list of born and raised in Seoul, South Korea, and I write to you regarding Return to Seoul. After listening to Mark's review, uh, which was because uh, Return to Seoul was released in South Korea this weekend, I decided to go yeah. and watch it. It was a bizarre experience, in a good way, to watch a film made by a Cambodian French director with a leading French Korean actor, with a bunch of well-known Korean actors as a supporting role, which was French-Korean co-production. Everything was weird but familiar, with seemingly slightly Southeast Asian-like nightscapes, but also eye-scorching neon lights written in Korean words reflected on the windows of cars at the same time. The... Can I just put one one, one it, it, It's a French, uh, current Cambodian production because it was Cambodia's entry right. for the foreign language film Oscar. The main protagonist dancing in the club holding a bottle of soju, which is a typical Korean spirit, yes. which is normally drunk in restaurants <laughs> but not at clubs, was the most weird thing I've ever seen in my movie experience. Later on, when Freddie takes a cab from Seoul to, I hope that's Jeonju, to visit a certain place... Yes which would have taken a fair four-hour drive. I simply imagine she must have paid tons of money for that drive. But what touched me the most was the conversation between Freddie and her paternal family through translation. This is the most accurate depiction of the homogenous and conservative Christian family of Korea ever in foreign production. In the meantime, I could witness Freddie's raw anger, mitigated by the translator's polite Korean way of translation, the fact the translator yeah. was a woman added to the frustration that in a traditional and also and also in contemporary on some level Korean society, women are often asked to be docile. So naturally, Freddie and her family, including his bi biological father, couldn't have uh, couldn't have exact communication from the first place. And I think this was the core theme of the movie from the start, where Freddie talks about interpreting the music notes from the first glance. It takes a pretty good amount of time and struggle for a person to really connect to the foreign culture. Uh, anyway, uh, Do Won Shin says, keep up the good work. Hello to Jason, up with Bluehead Feminist and all that, and down with so-and-so. P.S. By accident, I watched this film as a double bill with Rice Boy Sleeps, which was a movie about the Korean diaspora in Canada. Uh, and though it was a nicely matched film, it was quite stressful. So anyway, also <laughs> on this subject... That's a, it's a that's a lovely email. Thank you so much for that. It, it is it is really fascinating that he's a Cambodian French filmmaker. She is a French Korean actress, and it was Cambodia's entry for the ninety fifth Academy Awards. I mean, it is just in terms of the kind of the, a cross cultural film with a cross cultural heritage. It's really fascinating. Uh, number nine is Jody. Yes, which I haven't seen. I'm sorry, that's a new release, but it wasn't press screen. I haven't seen it. Number eight is uh, Pony and Selvan 2. Again, we talked about this last week. Wasn't press screened. We'll try and catch up with it. But I'm currently trying to catch up with Evil Dead Rise, which I still haven't done because it's been a complicated week. Uh, number seven uh, in the UK, number eight in America is Air. It's all about the shoe. Uh, six in this country, seven in America, Dungeons and Dragons, Honor Among Thieves. Much more fun than anybody had any right to expect, and it's done very, very well and more than washed its face at the box office. Number five here, John Wick, Chapter 4. Uh, if you go and see it, prepare. you must stay, obviously, right to the end and not leave 90 seconds 
before it finishes as I had to. <laughs> Are you going to go back and watch the whole thing that's, all that's over again? Me. I think I might wait till it's on uh, streaming just to watch <laughs> the final 90 seconds to realise that um, I shouldn't have left. Um, so that's number five. Number four is The Unlikely Pilgrimage of Harold Fry. Which I think you and I both liked. I It was fascinating uh, talking to Penelope Wilton about it because she talks so eloquently about it. Um, it is definitely one of those films that when you're watching it, it, it doesn't have as much impact as it does a week or so later. And certainly, you know, I've been listening to the soundtrack and those uh, songs, which I think are really, really moving songs. And I've been thinking about scenes from the film that when I was watching it, they just seemed to sort of, I mean, it it does that really clever thing about it gets under your skin without you realising that it's doing it. And it, it's, it has more profundity than it seems to have at the time. And I also think I will stand by my comparison. That there is a lot of life of Brian in the idea of him doing this walk and suddenly picking up these pilgrims whom he does not want to follow him. And yet they have decided that they are going to because, well, they've decided. Yes. <clears throat> and if you missed the Penelope Wilton conversation, that's uh, available still, obviously, uh, from a couple of weeks ago. Uh, number one here, number one in the States, Guardians of the Galaxy 3. I'll do some uh, emails and then you can go again. Simon. Uh, you... So no, so you've just jumped from number four to number one? Yeah. Actually, that's all. I... Okay. Why, why did you do that? Because on page 13, that's what it does. But I will now fill in the gaps, which you very <laughs> eloquently pointed out that um, I jumped. Which well, right. Well, we've really said I haven't yet seen Evil Dead Rise, which I, I, have we got any emails about it? Because everyone thinks it's brilliant and I'm the only person who hasn't seen it at the moment. Uh, no. Okay, well, Evil Dead Rise sounds absolutely fabulous and I'm going to go and see it, particularly after uh, Robbie's review of it. He was, uh, he was very enthusiastic. So I'm going to go and see it. Number two, Super Mario Brothers, uh, the movie. <laughs> How much has it taken uh, now? It has taken... 42,000. Stunning amounts of money. Yeah. So there'll be another I mean, one. it's all right. Uh, and as I was saying, number one here and number one in the States is uh, Guardians of the Galaxy 3. Simon... Which is... Oh, I'll, sorry, I'll you read out some emails and then you can yeah, yeah. jump in. Yeah. Simon right. Zek, Dick Root and Rocket, just got in from watching... Guardians of the Galaxy 3 at the Dome in Worthing, which is one of my favourite old cinemas. A lovely cinema. Hello, Dave Norris. I took my eldest, who's 17, and we sat in the front row as we do for every Marvel movie, and we've done that since he was little. Each time I fear it'll be our last outing as he gets too cool for this kind of malarkey. The last few Marvels have been tiring and hard work and just hard to convince that they are worth persisting with. I went in with trepidation to the latest Guardians, hoping not to be disappointed. Well, from the moment Tom York's voice and the acoustic rendition set the scene, I was mesmerised. I grinned from ear to ear, laughed out loud, spent the last ten minutes with tears in my eyes. Turns out we are not all Avengers after all, predominantly white, predominantly male and predominantly superpowered. In fact, we're all Guardians, a rag-bagged rabble of misfits and freaks, a broken family with failings and foibles, but we all have our place in the family. United we are stronger than anyone, and love binds us all together. This is what Marvel have been trying to do since the end of the Avengers series. No one is perfect, everyone does what they can do for a reason, and we're all good and bad and deserve to be loved and looked after. And if it were... And if we are shown love, we can we can, and will be loved. Bravo, Marvel. Cheers, good doctors, from Simon Zek, who sound, sounds as though he had one of the most enjoyable experiences on the front row of the Dome in Worthing for, for a while. Well, I mean, it was really surprising to me because the, the, the thing that defined the, well, certainly the first Guardians of the Galaxy movie particularly, you know, which starts with that kind of dancing sequence and the, you know, the retro uh, playlist, it's very kind of, very upbeat, very jolly, very funny. The thing about Guardians Volume 3 is that at the centre of it is a very dark, very not funny story, which is Rocket's backstory, which is all about animal experimentation and vivisection. And I, as I said when I was reviewing it, I was, found myself moved to tears, which I really had not expected at all. And it is a, it's a credit to the film that that, I mean, you, funnily enough, you and I saw Bo is Afraid together. And as we walked out of the Sony, Sony, Sony. building in yeah. Paddington, whatever. We walked across the bridge, across the canal, and we bumped into James King. Looking like and, he was 12 uh, you years know, old. 
Yes, and we reminded him that he owes us his entire career and that you know all his success is that, entirely. No, he was grateful. He always says thank you. And then he said, what are you going to do? And I said, well, this evening I'm going to see Guardians of the Galaxy. And he said, oh, it's a lot darker than you expect. And I just thought, okay, that's, I don't believe that for a second. And James was absolutely right. It is really dark, but it works because of that. Um, it's There are sections in it which are quite scary, although there are sections in Toy Story that are quite scary. But it's very moving, and it is absolutely rocket story and i had not expected that to be what it is i know that everyone going to see it now will already know this but it i it caught me off guard and, and it moved me in a way that i hadn't expected it to just before we uh, we we leave guardians of the galaxy volume three greg allen's on our youtube channel which now includes full episodes wow um i haven't been that close to wetting myself for a long time charming <laughs> overall i really enjoyed this Thought it was a great final install installment. Nitpicks, maybe a bit too long and a bit much CGI okay. mayhem. And Adam Warlock was superfluous. Other than that, really entertaining and had me tearing up many times. Almost forgotten how much you love these characters. Yeah, Will Poulter is never entirely su superfluous, but I agree about the character. And it is true that the last 20 minutes in which it goes smashy, bashy, crashy, you know, planety, thrusty stuff, I'm, I, I don't, I'm not bothered. But, you know... You were you were very Roman there. Very what? I think. Very Rome. Very Rome or Roman. Yes. As in very Rome, very Roman, as in Roman Roy. Yes, that's what I thought you were. Okay, fine. Well I I shall take that as a compliment because he shares my hairstyle. He's clearly uh, been modelling his hair on mine. Is is that it right? Is. Okay. Thanks very much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed watching it as much as we enjoyed making it. While you're here, check out all the other videos because they're cool too, aren't they? They are. And if you want to keep up to date with everything Kermit and Mayo's take, then check out our social channels. I mean, why wouldn't you? I mean, I, I would. No, I have done. Excellent.